Welcome to this brand new episode of the Marketing Technology Podcast. This podcast is hosted by Mark van Horek and myself, Elias Klum. We're both from Marketing Guys, a MarTech agency based out of the Netherlands. Welcome to this new episode of the Marketing Technology Podcast. Today we have Elon. Elon is the co-founder, CMO at Visibo. So, Alan Alroy, welcome to the Marketing Technology Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Alon, one of the co-founders currently in New York, um, leading marketing and customer success at Bizabo. Bizabo is an event success platform. We help marketers and event organizers run virtual in-person and hybrid events. We are 170 people uh, between New York, Tel Aviv and um, Kiev, growing faster than ever before. And I'm excited to speak with you. Nice, so am I. Um, I'm excited to to start a conversation with you on these uh, events, of course, because um, well, as we, as we all know, COVID has uh, has changed a lot within the B two B marketing industry, especially when you look at events. Um, and um, today we're going to talk about the future of live events. Um, actually, this week a couple of vaccines uh, against COVID or Corona have been announced, and those will be rolled out probably the coming month. So we're all looking forward to returning to uh, to some of the events that we we used to organize and kind of get on the lead generation let's say uh, uh, that we were used to do and practices that we used to do as a b2b marketer but for now we're depending on uh, on on uh, live or on the online events and we can do a lot of live events depending on where you are in the world but in the us and europe it's it's quite hard to 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 organize anything like it so um looking at the future of live events uh, and events for b2b marketing purposes what, what's your opinion on that First, definitely the past year was a, a huge hit, not only to the global community, but um, specifically to the event industry that uh, marketing teams are dependent on. Not sure if uh, you know, but live events used to be the primary marketing channel of the average B2B CMO, and they invest 24%, again, on average, 24% of the marketing budget is usually been spent on events. And in March 2020, as a platform that powers live events around the world for customers such as, you know, Amazon and Salesforce and Bloomberg and Financial Times and and so on, um, within a week, a thousand events that were planned to to run in the following two months were all canceled within a week. And then in the following weeks, all of the other events were canceled. As a company, that was a big moment in time that we had to decide what do we do to stay in business. And we chose to be go back to startup days, be very agile. And we launched at the end of March a virtual solution and we in a way evolved our platform to support virtual events and since then uh, organizations and marketers in a way stay relevant and run virtual events on our platform and so far we've ran like tens of thousands of events and i'm very excited that live events will be back and to your question the future is hybrid the future is hybrid events virtual events will not disappear there are people who will not go back to live events because of health concerns and because they saw value in virtual events. That said, we are big believers in in person and in live events. And we do think that at the end of the day, nothing can replace in person, but the future would be an integrated experience between a virtual event and a live event. And I think it provides amazing opportunities for for marketers. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I fully agree there because um, when you're looking at a live event or a hybrid event in which you have like a live and online uh, part of, uh, of the event, 
um, some problems might be solved that we have when we have 100% online events. The, the, the main problem I hear back from B2B marketers, and I speak to B2B marketers on a daily basis, the main problem that I hear back from them is that it's hard for them to get qualified leads from online events the way they were used to getting getting them from in-person or, or live events. So if you're doing an online event, people might re register, um, they might even show up if you're if you're lucky, um, but they're no, no not as engaged as they are on a, a trade show or a roundtable session or whatever. Let's say summit you're organizing in person. Is that something you also see happening, or is it something you hear back from the community as well? When you think about it, until March. 99% of events in the world were, were live. There was a 1% of virtual events. Most people call these webinars uh, and a few of like real virtual events with, I don't know, avatars and stuff. But there wasn't a lot of technology investment around virtual events. So one cannot expect to have a lot of engagement around those virtual events because all of the platforms for virtual events, most of them were brand new. I do expect to see a lot of uh, innovation, at least while working on a lot of innovative engagement capabilities to change that sentiment and ensure that even those who cannot attend a live event would find the experience to be very engaging. That said, until today, um, what you're describing as a challenge is, is accurate. There are marketers who are used to maybe, are used to have their company exhibit at events and generate leads while standing at a booth and the virtual booth of today definitely do not provide the leads that marketers are used to. What we saw is that many marketing teams started organizing their own virtual events and the registration numbers that um, we see usually are five times higher than of a live event. So let's say you organize the live event and you used to have a thousand people when you run a virtual event and you're a decent marketer, you are likely to have five times the number of registrations, meaning 5,000 registrations. Yes, that audience is less of a captive audience. So the quality of the leads is not as good, but it is a game of volume. You do have more leads. And if you do a good job in engaging and nurturing those and thinking creatively, um, there are stories of, uh, of marketing teams who are generating actually a lot of pipeline from these virtual events, but even those marketers are very much looking forward to go back to live events because that hybrid opportunity would offer, um, in my mind, a one plus one equals three experience, meaning they can benefit from the remote audience by an improved virtual experience and benefit from the, um, the live event and can improve the experience of both audiences by into integrating them together. Okay, um, would it be accurate then to state that the online events are more the so-called top of funnel leads that you generate versus the in-person events that are used more because they're also more expensive. They, they, they're used more in the bottom of funnel for marketers. Is that, is that accurate to state it that way? Or is that, is that something you don't recognize? That would definitely be the case. You're going to run marketing programs in the form of a virtual event to generate top of funnel leads to also nurture your leads. And for more account based marketing and bottom of the funnel, um, engagement, you would run at the beginning until the vaccine is fully there. I expect that at the beginning in Q1, probably we're going to see more local events because most of the Q1, Q2 events, the planning cycles for these have already started. So you're not going to see large productions coming back in H1 just because um, the production cycles are going to be more complex. You would still need to cater to an audience that is uh, very concerned and want to see a safe event being planned. So the, the real, like the bigger live events would come back only in H2 and probably. 
and those will be used for bottom of the funnel, executive um, engagements, ABMs. So I'm aligned with you on that one. Absolutely. So um, until the second half of next year, we'll have to do with 100% online, probably, whether you like it or not. So we have to make the best out of it. And you obviously have a lot of experience in, uh, let's say, organizing for customers, um, the, the online events. Can you share some, let's say, best practices of successful online events? Because whether you like it or not, as a B2B marketer, you still have to, to rely on online events for your lead gen. Um, and you, uh, well, on your experience, would, would probably be, will probably be able to share some best practices, right? I think in the beginning, we saw many organizations who thought that the virtual event is like a webinar, that one and a half marketers can just organize it, click on a button, and um, expect to have an amazing, engaged audience that is uh, glued to the screen. And that is not the case anymore because of several reasons. Um, attendees expect more. Attendees have many competing priorities. Some of them are at their own home. So like when you organize a live event, you have a pretty large team producing, thinking, brainstorming, and coming up with the most creative, impressing experience they can the same notion and the same resources and the time should be devoted to running a virtual event. Uh, people need to understand that the alternative is a click of a button. It means that unlike a live event, when you show up, you, you're, again, you have a captive audience. People cannot run away. Um, at a virtual event, there are many other alternatives, meaning the content needs to be super engaging we recommend that um, virtual sessions are not more than 20 minutes based off our um, attendance engagement over time. Unlike maybe a live event that you have uh, keynotes of 45 minutes. So the shorter the better. Two, um, people will not sit an entire day usually. So if you want people to attend several sessions, um, the average duration is uh, again not more than half a day as a best practice. Um, we do see interesting things that can be done online and not at the live event to have a series of short engagements before the actual um, virtual event, and then a series of smaller sessions post the event. Because the production cost is lower on a virtual event, people can actually extend the duration of their event and engage their community over a longer period of time. Um, another thing to take into account. And third is, I, I like to say that people need to embrace the purple cow principle. There are millions of virtual events going on and you need to stand out by embracing a lot of creativity into your production. It can be pre, during, and post your event. Um, Otherwise, people will not stick around. Absolutely, and I fully agree with that. And that's you know we're, we're a big fan of uh, Seth Godin and, and his uh, purple cow that that started everything there. But um, I'm I'm just wondering because if you if you want to be that purple cow and stand out of the the rest in the the millions of events that are there, um, when you're looking at visible yourself, um, you organize some. Uh, events yourself. When when we when I visit the website, there is a big event coming up for November twenty fourth, um, the the next virtual summit uh, that that you organize yourselves. Um, can you share some best practices that you yourself have applied in promoting those events? So how uh, do you stand out, and how would you how how can we make sure that your audience really gets what, what why why they should register for your event? That's a great question. So first of all, in terms of content, we try to really bring a very diversified group of people that, um, again, will follow a purple cow in a way principle. Um, most people will bring only marketers and event planners to speak to marketers and event planners. So we decided to bring people from many different industries. So for example, 
we have someone from a big gaming industry to come and speak about um, how can marketers maybe borrow some gaming elements to make online experiences more engaging. And then we also think that there's a big sense of um, a need for a community again. When you, when you go into a live event, you have that feeling that you're part of a community that when you're sitting at home, it's very lacking. So we're bringing someone from Burning Man, which is one of the most amazing communities out there. So first of all, the selection of speakers needs to be creative and curated, and that's what we're doing for our own event, almost hybrid, um, that is taking place in around two weeks. And lastly, we also make sure to make it a lot of fun by incorporating a lot of uh, entertainment sessions from live DJs to an improv group that will actually improvise and entertainment and make people laugh throughout the event. And two, we make sure that it's engaging to the attendees so people can actually submit questions in the um, in advance and actually influence the content that will be broadcasted and the content that and what speakers are going to talk about so we make them feel involved and by that committing committing to to participate and not just watch it on demand okay and um, I noticed on your website that you you um, run a, a marketing automation platform, HubSpot. Um, is is are you using your marketing automation tool as well in the invitation and let's say engaging the audience uh, for the event um, and maybe afterwards? Is that something that that you are uh, looking at or already doing? I to personalize. Um everything as much as possible. So we have around six different um, campaigns to six different segments um, that we are that, that we are targeting. For example, some of those segments, people who attended some of our previous events, we have a segment for our customers, we have vertical-based segments, we have persona-based segments, and everyone is getting a different campaign that uh, differentiates in the copy and the frequency of emails and in the CTAs based on intent and interest. Um, so to your question, for sure, we're also then leveraging um, the data we have for retargeting campaigns to make sure that um, we're not only targeting people over email, we're also activating our own employees with uh, sophisticated tracking links and promo codes through Visible that is integrated with HubSpot and arranging some internal competitions between the sales team and the customer success team to see who is able to attract more people to the event. And while we'll providing awards internally and providing a lot of recognition to internal teams, because at the end of the day, people are more likely to attend an event when they hear about it from a friend or a colleague on social media than to hear about it from the organizing company. So we're definitely trying to activate and have ambassadors um, promoting the event instead of us promoting it directly. Wow, so those were some great uh, tips, Alon, and I, I would like to thank you very much for sharing those on the Marketing Technology Podcast. I will share uh, the link to uh, the Visible website as well as to the uh, event in the, share no in the, in the show notes. Um, is there uh, something you would like to add here, or is there a way people could reach out to you should they have any questions after listening to this podcast? First of all, thank you for listening. Um, to learn more about Visible, the website is probably the best place to start. And I do think these are exciting times to be a marketer and to be an event marketer. A lot of innovation is coming and the industry is changing and is being disrupted. And I think good outcomes will come out of it and hopefully um, everyone will be healthy and we're gonna go back to those uh, fun old days in which we can run events, be together, be in, get inspired and make in person. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Marketing Technology Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform or iTunes. Also, if you want to be a guest or know someone that should be a guest to our show, shoot me an email on e.crum at marketingguys.nl. Thank you for listening.